it's a kind of reaction to the very corporate end of the LGBT scene that exists in most cities. I'm Michael Upson. I am the creator and founder of Love Muscle, which is a sort of queer uh, house and techno disco funk soul night that we do uh, in Leeds. The night is monthly. Um, we tried to do it every six weeks, roughly, but it's kind of just become a monthly party now. I think the, the demand is there. And there. There aren't many other interesting queer things that go on in Leeds, so I think you know running it monthly makes sense. I came to uni in Leeds about ten years ago, and when I got here, the queer scene here was at side of Lower Brigger, which is this amalgamation of really terrible bars. There really wasn't much for me to like go out and express myself and feel good about my sexuality. I think certainly going to places like the NYC Danlow at Glastonbury, Chapter 10, uh, Homo Electric in Manchester really cemented the fact that you know we could do something really exciting here. The popularity of the night is testament to how needed it was I think in the city so you know we sell out every party and people really 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 love coming here and love feeling good about themselves and it feels like that they didn't have anywhere to do that before. It's a kind of reaction to the very corporate end of the LGBT scene that exists in most cities. I just think in Leeds maybe there hadn't been something like that for maybe 10-15 years. Previously there was Vague and Speed Queen which were two really really fab sort of LGBT nights that pushed the boundaries of good music. We generally tend to only book people who are LGBT with the exception of some few female DJs that we really really enjoy. As well as being an LGBT sort of safer space because we enforce that safer space of policy to the extent which we do we find that a lot of other minority groups find comfort in coming down here and, and, and enjoy parties here so I feel like as long as we're representing those different groups and they come down and see people that look like them and sound like them and feel good about themselves because they can see people you know doing really well going around the world and being DJs then I think that's really important so I think we, we book people in order to showcase them as LGBT role models basically. A lot of the music we play has its origins in the disenfranchised black gay culture that stemmed around New York, Chicago, parts of San Francisco and Detroit. There's a bit of gay culture and, and the history within that music and I think it's important to let LGBT people know that that music was created pretty predominantly for and by LGBT people in the sort of late 80s and early 90s. A lot of it is is, is US based because that's where that music, that's where disco culture, you know, sort of came from. But then again, you know, if you look back to the early 90s, you know, th there is a, a UK history to that as well. It's there to allow people to feel comfortable coming back to us and saying, you know, this happened on the evening, I wasn't comfortable with this, and then we're able to assess that situation in the room and decide whether that person needs to be kicked out, needs to be barred, it just needs to be a small conversation had between two people. We're basically just trying to make the room as comfortable and as enjoyable for as many people as possible. I think it allows people to feel more relaxed, and when people feel more relaxed and feel more happy and feel more confident, they don't have to constantly be on edge and constantly checking over the shoulder and, you know, constantly having to move away from somebody who's like dancing too close to them or just interfering with their personal space it, it, it creates a better atmosphere in a party full stop like I think you know people enjoy themselves more if they're in the knowledge that they're you know not having to look out for themselves constantly 24 7. We wouldn't be able to do the party without Wharf and the way Wharf is set up as a co-op because all of the profit that gets made by the building goes back into the building and everybody has an equal share and say in what goes on um, it means that there's not a profit margin to be hit on an evening in order to keep the venue afloat because somebody's taking a cut of that and taking that off. When the party started there wasn't that very many people that used to come to it you know it was um you know the first six months of doing them it was dead <laughs> but they believed in us and they allowed us to keep continuing keep going because you know they believed it was a worthwhile cause and because the venue doesn't demand that much money being put back into it so we don't allow any photography or any video to be recorded in the club at all that's basically just to make people feel more comfortable and relaxed and they are therefore more free to express themselves in ways that they potentially wouldn't if they thought it was a possibility that somebody with a camera phone or a smartphone you know might catch them fully naked or in a dress or little things that allow people to film so they can express themselves as freely as they want to. The scene itself is in such disarray in Leeds because of the, the monopoly that one or two people have over the areas in Leeds which are classed as the LGBT quarter as it were, the LGBT area of town and they have a almost a disdain for the bars that they own. The people that own them don't go out clubbing in their own bars, I see them in various other places in the city and they're not interested in making those venues in any way safer spaces for LGBT people. And I know a lot of people who feel very uncomfortable and threatened going to those places if they're from a you know, particular minority group from within the LGBT scene. We have the world's most convoluted ticketing system. It stems from the fact that within DIY clubbing, in Leeds especially, because there's a quite an appetite for it, tickets, if you sell them online, tend to go in hours, half day, 
spaces. And a lot of our older clientele don't, you know, they aren't fixed to Facebook 24 seven. Uh, and I think it's really important to be able to protect that kind of like broad demographic of people that come to our, our night. We just make it really fair and simple that, you know, if you want a ticket, you have to physically come down to the venue to get one. And I think what that also does as well is it separates the people who really want to go from the people that have just heard about it and they're coming with their friends. If you have to go down to a venue and pick up a ticket, that's some time and it's your time that you've invested in even before you've got to the party. And I think that's a really, it's an important distinguisher between people who really want to be there and people who maybe have just been dragged along by their friends for a ticket. So as the popularity of the party um, increased and we were ending up with sort of like queues around the corner and stuff, we were quite concerned that it would put off a lot of our LGBT crowd because obviously a lot of people from the city who aren't from the LGBT scene have heard good things about the night and want to come down. So one of the ways that we sort of try to protect the, the queer audience that come to our party is through our membership scheme. So we've got little laminated cards that we made. And this just means that everybody who's a member gets two tickets put aside for them in the bar so that they can pick those up at any time and they're reserved right up until the night before the party. So they don't have to sort of like rush down to get the tickets, but it also means that they're guaranteed to if you're ever wondering if you want, you know, if you're, if you're looking to put on a night similar to this, and you're wondering what, how do I protect that core LGBT crowd, then a membership scheme is a really great way to do it.